When I look back to when I was a kid, the challenge of the generation was nuclear war. Now, it might seem strange, but when I was a kid, we got instruction about what to do if an atomic bomb exploded. Evidently, the desks at school are so strong, they will withstand a nuclear explosion. You know, and there was all these different films we saw on the TV about what was going to happen. And, you know, for that generation, it was a challenge because it was though we were going to enter atomic war any day then. And when I spoke to my parents, the challenge for them in their time, if you like, was the Second World War. You know, were we actually going to see victory? And of course, with hindsight, we look back and we say, well, of course we were going to win the war. Of course there wasn't going to be atomic war. But you know, hindsight is a great thing, isn't it? And then as I look through the ages, you know, there was an age where um, there was industrial unrest. When I started work, we were on the three-day week. And people were saying, how will the country ever survive if there's only three days a week? And there'll be days when we'd have no electricity. You know, and it was a challenge to that age. And then as we go on a bit more, you know, we came across the HIV, the AIDS epidemic that came out. This was a disease that nobody could cure. Does that sound familiar? Okay, that was sweeping the world, and it seemed that everything was focused on that age. How do we deal with this particular epidemic? And then a little bit later on, of course, we had the financial crash. I guess you're all old enough to remember the financial crash. Do you remember? You know, when stock markets around the world lost their value, people were losing their jobs, and we were saying, how will we ever survive this? And you know, and in some ways, you know, the challenge that's facing us today, the coronavirus, I guess is the challenge of our age. And the thing I want to say is this, is that it's a challenge to the Christians, because we believe in a God, don't we, that loves us. Is that right? Yeah. We believe in a God who said, I will take care of you. Do we believe that? Yes. So if we do, I take it no one here is worried about the outbreak. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> All the heads are nodding because if I don't nod my head, I'm in real trouble here. <laughs> you see, I believe God is in full control. And so you might say to me, well, why is it then that God allows these different things to come along? And you know, I, I believe, you know, in, in my head, <laughs> what I believe, I believe God challenges us. You know, this world is a broken world. It's not the main event. <laughs> The main event is yet to come, come. and God wants to, everybody to be saved. The trouble is, if we get comfortable in this world, we think, do you know what? We don't need God because we've got heaven right here. And God's trying to say, no, I'm trying to draw your attention. And you know, it's at times of crisis that suddenly our attention is caught. Is that right? Yeah. You know, and we start to think about our own mortality, What's going to happen later on? And I believe, you know, as Christians, this is the time that we can take responsibility and point people to say, I, I understand there's a real concern, but you know, I am not worried because there is a God in heaven that not only will see me through this, whatever this happens to be, but one day I will live with him in eternity. And you see, if our Christian faith means anything... It's only in times of crisis that you see that. You know, if things are hunky-dory with our lives and we're having a great time, of course it's easy to be a Christian. Why wouldn't you be a Christian? But the thing is, when things go wrong, if we can still say, I still believe in God. I still have a faith. And though the world may be falling apart all around me, I will not fear. I won't fear. Why? Because I know my God has got it in hand. Whatever happens to me, it might be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are thrown into the furnace. You see, God didn't deliver them before the furnace time. They actually had to go through the furnace. And it was that that grabbed people's attention. And so may I encourage us as Christians this morning, as disciples of Jesus Christ, that it's how we live over these next few days and weeks, how we react that the world will take notice of what we do.
That's not to say we're immune to what's going to go on, as you'll see later on in some of my message. We're not immune to it, but how we react to it is really key to what people will see. So are you at John 14, verse 15? John 14, verse 15. I've not got there myself yet, so here we are. Here, are John 14, verse 15. Oh, sorry, no, I'm sorry. Um, it's the wrong verse, don't mind. It says here, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus' plea with mankind, if we love him, we will keep his commandments. And then, if you'd like to quickly turn back to Matthew 28, just to let you get there, just three books beforehand, Matthew 28. So remember that first one, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We turn back to Matthew 28, and we're going to go to verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. Here we are, get there. This is Jesus, just as he's ascending back into heaven. He's got his disciples there with him, and he says this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age." Jesus' command to everybody who would call themselves a disciple is to what? Go. That's what Mike was talking about last week. Go. And what? Go and have a good time. Go and show. Go sing songs to them. No, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. In other words, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you're doing everything that Jesus commanded you, go and make other people do the same by make. It's not like, come on, you've got to... Uh, you know, because one of the things we do is love one another. You can't make someone love someone. But you know, by the way we set the example in our word, in our acts, in our different things that we do and how we live our motivation life, people should be seeing, wow, there is a disciple of Jesus Christ. And what's more, I want that. You know, why is it, do you think, that if you were to go into your workplace and you say come on, why don't you become a disciple of Jesus Christ? They would look at you and go, what? What, are you mad? And yet, there were people who saw Jesus and they said, I want to be just like that man. Is it because of the way sometimes we live our discipled life? It's a bit based on bigotry. And it's a bit based, it's a lot of hypocrisy that people say, do you know what? I would never want to be like that person. Is that the reason sometimes why we find it hard to make disciples? There's a big difference between someone who is a disciple and someone who is a believer. Now, I would take it this morning that most people here in this place are believers. And I'm not going to do this, but if I was to ask people to put up their hands, so how many believers here... And then, how many disciples do we have here? I wonder what we would do, how we would be challenged by that. So what's the difference between a disciple and a believer? You know, in some ways, it's like asking, what's the difference between a young person or a child and an adult? What's the difference? How do you recognize when somebody becomes an adult? And let me tell you, it's not an age thing. <laughs> you know, because I meet some people who are in their 30s and 40s who are the biggest kids, uh, and I mean that in a derogatory sense. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm a big kid, all right, all right, because I like kids. But do you know what? The trouble is, is that when you think about it, when a child is growing up, you'll notice it's all about them. It's about their happiness. I want my way. I want chocolate now. All right? You see, as a child, and then also, as a child, they have never had to provide for themselves. It's all given to them. Is that right? Okay. 
They've never had to provide for anybody else, right? Because it's all about them. And then one day, hopefully, they wake up. And they recognize life isn't just about them. It's about others. Because now I have to provide for others. And I've mentioned this before. When Claire, my daughter, was born... Um, born in hospital, and you know, you, you get nine months, you know, for this event to happen. But when Claire was born, and I saw her for the first time. I suddenly had this amazing, overwhelming pressure. I am now responsible for life. I, 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 yeah, I, I knew the words, but I suddenly realised me, personally, with Janice, my wife, of course, we were now responsible. For for a life. And it was so overwhelming that I passed out. <laughs> and I came to as they wheeled me through the hospital corridors, and there was, there was a voice which said, here's another one. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it wasn't the birth. It was the sudden realization that I am responsible. I'm responsible for a life. And in some ways, the difference between a disciple and a believer is this. You see, when we first get saved, it's all about us, isn't it? It's about what God has done for me. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, that you're saving me. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to protect me from all these different things that come to me. And when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thank you, Lord, for that you are with me. You see, it's very selfish. It's very true. (laughs) But you see, the difference between a disciple and a believer is that one day we wake up and we realize that God's love is not just about us. It's about how we communicate that to other people. It's called taking responsibility. Jesus, when he went back into heaven, he said, look, I want you to take responsibility. You are in a world that is lost. You are in a world full of fear. Isn't that true today? But you have the answer. Because you see, with the Holy Spirit inside of us, we become equipped to go and spread the good news. What's the good news? The good news is that God isn't angry with us. The good news is that no matter what you are going through, you can know a loving Savior who will give you peace and will give you joy. No matter what is going on, even in the middle of a war zone, he will give that to you. And in some ways, we have the answer. And there's a world out there that's crying out for answers. The thing is, Are we prepared to go out? You see, that's the difference between a believer and a disciple. A disciple is someone who will go out and be the good news to the broken world round about us. As I was looking into this, you know, I... I, It's funny, we had a preaching meeting the other week. We said, try and avoid the three points. Guess what? I've got three points. (laughs) But I was trying to say, what is the difference? I want to go into this a little bit more. How do we know if we are disciples? And there are three characteristics of a disciple that I want to cover this morning. And the first one is this. A disciple realizes that they are accountable to God. And that one day we must give and account of ourselves. In Romans 14 and verse 12, I'll read this out to you, it says this, so then each one of us will give an account of ourselves to God. One day, we will stand in front of our Lord and Saviour, and he'll say to us, what did you do with the stuff that I gave you? (laughs) What did you do? You know, and I find that an incredibly hard challenge. Responsibility, I told told the message calling taking responsibility. Responsibility is defined as the state 
of being accountable. And responsible behaviour, when I looked it up in the dictionary, says this. It's made up of five essential elements. It's made up of honesty. It's made of compassion or respect. It's made up of fairness. It's made up of accountability. And it's made up of courage. You see, one day, I will have to face my creator. And I'll have to account of how I used my time, of how I used my possessions. He commanded me to go and make disciples. And can I say in front of him that I honestly lived as a Christian? I honestly had compassion and respect for the people that I met with every day, that I treated them with fairness, and that I took responsibility of being the good news where they are. The second thing that I find that separates a believer from a disciple is this, is they use what they have. (laughs) You know, no thing that we have, no talent that we have is too small that it can't be used by God. Graham mentioned during the offering, there was that widow who gave just the two mites. God was able to use it. As we go into Acts, We read of the people that sold land and gave it to the early church, and God used it. But we also read of a boy who only had, was it five loaves and two fishes, and God was able to use that. You see, he can use however little or however much we have, provided we give it into his service. You know, when we say, to God, Lord, take my whole life. Take me and use me. I wonder if we really mean that. I wonder if I really mean it. So often we say, Lord, you know, so often we say, Lord, if only I had a million pounds. If only I could preach better. If only, if only, if only. And you see, God's not really interested in the stuff we don't have. He's interested in the stuff that we do have. Because he said, look, if you use what you do have, I'm able to bless it. In Matthew 25, there's a whole chapter, uh, the chapter, and there's the parable of the bags of gold. And in your groups this week, I've given you more references into this. And there's also the parable of the talents. Do you remember what Jesus said? What was it? It was about how people were given stuff, some only small amounts, some large amounts. And when the master came back, he said, what did you do with the stuff I gave you? (laughs) And what happened to those who basically just hid it? He called them wicked. I remember those who were given resources. It says this, well done, good and faithful servant for those who used what they had. But to those who didn't use what they had, God judged them. If all we have in our life is food, let's give it to food bank. (laughs) If all we have is a spare five minutes each week, because I'm so busy, let's use that five minutes to go and chat with a neighbour or someone you know who is lonely and talk about the good news, about how there's a God who loves them. I know sometimes we get so fearful, if I say something weird, they're going to think I'm a complete idiot. But let me tell you, my experience is this. Whenever I've gone up to somebody, and you know, God's put them on my heart, and I say to them, I'm really sorry you're going through this, would you mind if I pray for you? Right, and they're not a Christian, they don't go to church, and I've just said, do you know, I've never been turned down. (laughs) Everyone said, I would really like that. Do you know what? It's a road in. You know, and I say, look, I'm praying because I by myself cannot, hurt, cannot, hurt, um, cannot um, heal you, but I know one who can. I know one who can give you peace in your current situation. Hallelujah. Let's use what we have rather than wish for stuff that we don't have. By the way, Jesus did say that for those who have, he will give more. And the third thing about being a disciple, so the two things so far, 
They realize they're accountable to God and not to man. <laughs> Two, they use what they have. And three, their focus is on building God's kingdom and not theirs. So often the world will tell us, you need to amass stuff. You know, amass stuff. When Jesus says, no, I want you to give it away. <laughs> Those who lose their life will save it. Isn't that weird? Now, we know these verses, but boy, is it so hard to live these things. You know, God's kingdom is a place where there is love, where there is joy, and where there is peace. And you can be in the middle of a war zone, and yet you can still bring love and joy and peace to the people. And as you do that, you are building God's kingdom kingdom, because that's where his kingdom is. What a simple message, how difficult it is to live. You know, as I put down these words, I am so challenged <laughs> by these words. I, I, I don't use this message as a saying, look, here I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to myself. This is a challenge to me. It's a challenge to all of us. And something, you know, in our groups, we can, let's encourage one another. How do we become true disciples? I want you to turn to Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. I'm going to give you some practical examples here now. Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. Let's quickly zap over there. You know, just before we read this, we often think that disciples are superheroes. Graham brought a great message two weeks ago about the myth of the super Christian. All right? And so often we think, to be a disciple, I've got to be a swashbuckling person who goes in there and I, the dead get raised and all those kind of things. And, and that may happen to one or two of you. That's great. But for the majority of us, that is not what we experience. So have you got there? Yeah. Matt, oh, so Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when they arrived, they took him to the upper room. And all the widows stood beside him, weeping, and showing the tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. It's interesting the Bible starts off straight away that this woman, Dorcas, I'll call her, was a disciple. Straight away, she was a disciple. Now, as far as we know, she wasn't a preacher. She didn't serve in a local church. Um, she wasn't a miracle worker. But what she did do was she made clothes. Clothes? Do you know what? You can be a disciple if you just make clothes. It says that what she did, though, was always for other people. We're not told that she was a rich person. In fact, she lived by herself. The chances are she was quite poor. And also notice is that she got sick. Sometimes people say, if you're a disciple, you're never going to get sick. Not true. <laughs> she got sick. And what's more, she died. How many people say, well, she couldn't have lived a very good life then because she died? She was sick, she probably died early, otherwise they wouldn't have been upset. But there was something about this woman that the Bible wants to record for all history, is that it says that she was full of doing good. Yeah. 
and she made things for the poor. What a great example. You see, if we do good, (laughs) if we help the poor, the Bible says you're a disciple, as this woman was. I wonder, how good are you at making clothes? (laughs) Um, Bruno, I think we do, um, where's Bruno? I'm sorry there. We do baby blessings, don't we? Okay, I don't know if you know, but in this church, um, for people who we, we get to hear about who are having a baby, we put a little box together with clothes and all the basic essentials for keeping a baby going, isn't it? Something like that. Okay, so if that's something you, you could do, go and see Bruna, because I'm sure Bruna would love to get clothes and things like that. It's something we can do. You know, these things seem so small, and yet the Bible raised them, they are so important. You see, being a disciple is just looking out, just looking out for people and just blessing them. And I've noticed that if you bless someone, at some stage, they will say to you, why are you doing this? And it's at that point we can say, do you know what? I'm blessing you because God's blessed me. <laughs> I'm happy because God has blessed me, and I just want to pass that happiness on. And it's those small words. You know, we don't have to convince people about there being a God. The Holy Spirit will do that for you. All we have to do is turn up and be kind. (laughs) That's it. The Holy Spirit will work on, and the Bible will call you a disciple. How quickly... From being a believer, can you make it to being a disciple? You know, quite often we say, well, look, if you believe, right, if you come to Jesus, then here's a number of programs we want to send you through. (laughs) Right, first of all, you need to come and understand what a believer is, all right? And then once you've done that, we're going to send you on some basic Bible courses, but there's nothing wrong with these things. You know, and then we're going to get you to come to the prayer meeting. And, you know, and over the time, if you're good enough, you might finally become a disciple. Is that what the Bible says? Let's turn to Luke chapter 19. And let's see how Jesus did it. You know, I'm often challenged in my Christian life. Is that I, you know, because I've done all the programs... I know it all. And then I look at the example of Jesus, and he breaks all the rules of the programs for some reason. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Who doesn't know this story? (laughs) The story of Zacchaeus. As he entered Jericho and was passing through, this is Jesus, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, and, and because he was unable, and he was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass that way. That's Jesus was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he said, "You must be born again. You must repent." You must, no, he, hung, he didn't say. Hang on, let's go back. Um, when Jesus came, he looked up and said to him, "Zacchaeus, hurry, come down." For today I must stay at your house. What about repent and be baptized? No, it doesn't come into it. And he hurried and came down and received him joy gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. He hasn't done the 18 different programs that we put in place. (laughs) Zacchaeus stopped. Here's the difference, though. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Lord, I half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today, today, salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man was come, has come to seek and to save that was lost. You see, someone was someone who wasn't really popular. Partly because of his size, sometimes small people tend to get picked on. Partly because of his job, he worked for the government, he worked for the Roman occupation. 
and partly because he exploited his position. Probably took more than he was supposed to. And yet, God's love is such, it sees past all of that. And it looks to the heart, and he says, I want you to follow me. It doesn't matter what you have done out there. <laughs> you may have think you've run the most wicked life. There's no way that you could be a disciple, and yet God says to you, look, just follow me. And you follow me by doing good. You follow me by living right. You follow me by acknowledging that I am God. And through that, Zacchaeus, salvation come. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can become a disciple right now. It just needs a change of heart, a realization that God loves you and that he paid the punishment for your sins on the cross of Calvary. He's already paid it for you. All he wants to do is come to tea in your life. <laughs> That's all he needs you to do. And you at that moment become a disciple. You see, discipleship is a total commitment to a way of life. A life that puts faith into action. Remember January, faith? It puts that faith into action through love, which was our topic last month. And when we do that, when we put into action, we become disciples. There's no such thing as retiring. <laughs> You know, people say to me, well, have you retired? Or they, they seem to think that because I've retired, I've got plenty of time on my hands. Yeah, right. I just explain to people, you know, I, I've, yes, I've retired. It's just I don't get paid anymore. I'm still just as busy as I ever I was. <laughs> you see, retirement means giving up responsibility. Yeah. There's no such thing in God's kingdom. We never give up the responsibility that is ours to make disciples. I just want to turn to one other verse as we bring this to a close. I'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. Let's just get there. Oh, I think you probably beat me there. Here we are, Matthew 5, verse 14. Jesus said this You are the light of of the world. You know, this echoes something that Jesus said a little bit earlier on, where he said, I am the light of the world. But you know, if we are his followers, then we are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a light, uh, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, this message is quite a simple one. To be a disciple, we just have to take up the responsibility that Jesus has given us, and that is to do good. You know, and when people ask us why we've done good, we're able to give an answer and say, it's because of what Jesus has done for me. You know, one day, as I mentioned at the start, we all have to give an account of what we've done with the stuff that God gave us. I just pray that God will take what I've done and, and he'll say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. I pray that for all of us in this place because if we want to change Gravesend, if we want to change the world, then we need to be the disciples he's called us to be. And that just means trusting him, that in what we say and what we do as we go out there to proclaim God's message, that God will use that. You know, as the kids in the schools, you know, they've been hearing the why message, why Easter. I just pray, I'm sure that the kids will see the team that's gone in there. They'll see this bunch of adults who are really enthusiastic about someone who died. And yet, through what they do, I'm sure they see kindness and they see love 
And I guarantee you, it will affect their lives in the future. And that's what I pray for all of us. Can we just, just stand a moment? I know it's been a challenge, but I just want to challenge everyone now. And I want you to reach out, just like to close your eyes. And perhaps you want to say after me, Heavenly Father, we love you. And we most earnestly desire to be your disciples, to show the love, to be joyful, to be at peace because we trust you. And Lord, let our example glorify your holy name and change lives. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. No, there may be some people here who say, well, I'm not quite sure what it is to believe. You know, we, we have a prayer room, and I'm going to be here at the front of the, the hall as well. If you'd like to have prayer, then I'd suggest if you go out to the side and there's a prayer room there, you can ask people to pray. Or if you want to know more about coming to know the Lord, then you can either go to the prayer room or you can come to the front, and there'll be a few of us here. And we'd love to pray with you so that we go out of this place, world changes. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen.